Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Laura Whitford and I'm the Director of Conservation Partnerships for the Nature Conservancy Asia Pacific. It is my great pleasure to be your moderator for today's session on the PEARL, Identifying and Accelerating Bankable Ocean Projects. So you might be asking, why is this session named after a PEARL? Well, as we know, pearls are rare and precious and they take time to form. Um, as you may know, they start forming when an external particle, like a grain of sand, works its way into an oyster or a mussel or a clam, which then coats the particle as a defence mechanism. So layer upon layer of this coating is deposited on the particle until a lustrous pearl is formed. So similarly, in ocean finance, we're talking about a small pipeline of projects, so they're rare, uh, while finding the right projects and making them profitable or precious requires time as well as patience and the right accelerating mechanisms. So before we get started, we wanted to get a sense of who we have in the audience today. So we are going to ask you to participate in a quick poll to let us know which region you're joining us from. So I'm hopeful that you can see there on your screen the poll options. So you can pick from Pacific or Southeast Asia or South Asia or East Asia or Central and West Asia or other. So we'll give you some time to put in your answers there. And then once you've done that, following on from that, we would love to know what kind of organisation you represent. So government, international organisation, NGO, um, or are you from a community or civil society or the private sector, um, technical organisations or academia. So if you can make a note, we'll come back to that a little bit later. So... Today, you are lucky enough to be hearing from some fantastic speakers who are going to help us understand how bankable ocean projects are identified and accelerated with examples from organisations on their specific approaches as well as their lessons learned. So as you would all know, as a global community, we've set ambitious commitments and targets for achieving healthy oceans. Um, however, as we know, the true cost to save the oceans and scale up these investments is huge. Um, you know, over the last few years, we've actually seen the funding gap widen 
as domestic and donor resources are directed to much needed relief and stimulus packages for COVID-19. We now have an opportunity though for Blue Finance to play a critical role in addressing financing challenges and boosting investment towards a blue recovery in the aftermath of the pandemic. So ocean finance, what is it? It can be defined as generating, investing, aligning and accounting for financial capital to achieve sustained ocean health and governance. So in this session, we're going to take a deep dive into how bankable ocean projects are identified and accelerated with examples of successfully incubated ocean projects. By the end of the session, we want you to have an understanding of the role of the key components that organisations are looking for to identify bankable projects and their approaches for accelerating them. So, before we move to the first speaker, let's quickly have a look at the results of the poll. So, you can see the vast majority of people, it looks like, from Southeast Asia, but we also have some folks from South Asia as well as um, other. So, wonderful to see the diversity of the uh, participants we have here today. Um, Okay, so first up, we're going to hear from Ted Janoulis, the founder and principal of Investable Oceans, a New York ocean investment platform whose mission is to accelerate market-based sustainable ocean investing across all asset classes and all sectors of the blue economy. So Ted, can you please tell us what is a bankable ocean project and why is bankability so important? Thank you so much, Laura, and thank you so much for having me here um, live from the New York City area where it is very cold and very dark right now. Um, so having had some conversations um, ahead of time with the panelists and also seen some of the videos we're going to see, I thought I would just spend my couple of minutes on uh, the term bankable ocean project. And just uh, maybe in, in terms of going a little deeper, we can talk about uh, a bit of shared vocabulary on what those terms mean. So project, uh, tonight or uh, this morning, you're talking to people who largely, uh, not all the time, but often deal with companies. And companies versus projects, there are some distinctions. There's no bright lines between them, but generally projects often have defined parameters, whether it's time or scope. Um, and they can be very long uh, in time and they can be very big in scope, but it's a, sort of a different um, feeling than when you're cultivating companies and growing them in sort of the finance sense. Uh, fortunately, uh, both, uh, both of those share the characteristics when you're looking for what you would consider bankable. They, they, the same qualities pertain to both of those subsets. With respect to bankable, it's interesting. Again, a lot of us tonight or this morning are involved with um, companies that are uh, operating for profit. So you're looking for market-based um, investors. Um, and that's a certain kind of thing because you're, you're trying to be competitive with other things, whether they're land or space oriented, whether they're venture capital or private equity, you're not looking to sacrifice a market return. All the good benefits come on top of that. Um, but capital comes in many flavors. And if you go down the spectrum all the way to the other side, um, you have philanthropy and grants, uh, government work, uh, you have loans that don't have to be prepa prepaid, vital, vital pieces, but there's not expected to get uh, either capital back or return on it. And there are all kinds of things in between. So if you think about that continuum, um, in the middle there is this hugely important area that we're all focused on at this conference and in our daily lives. Uh, and that's the place where you have blended finance. You have these different types of capital coming together. Sometimes you have uh, concessionary capital, which could be the forgivable loan or a grant, and that allows more capital to come in from the market. And what we want to do is stimulate as much as we can to get more bankable projects. We want to use that those resources that are willing to de-risk and willing to lay the groundwork to pull in the larger capital market pool. So there's this enormous place there in the middle. So confusingly, if someone says, is this a bankable project? 
a, a, a company or venture capitalist might say, yes, because I can get a big return on it. Not that they can't want the social returns as well. Um, but then you'll get a philanthropist who'll say, of course, this is bankable. These people really know what they're doing. It's important. It's measurable. You can have impact. Yes, it's bankable. And of course, everybody in any variation on that theme could say the same thing. So it's a little confusing. Um, but the good news is, even though they might be thinking of different elements when they say this is bankable, they're all looking at the same things. And is it positive impact? Is there a legal and political uh, foundation and structure? Um, is it a sound management team, either tightly defined in a startup or broadly defined with a large um, enterprise? Is it based on science? Is it based on firm foundations? Is it something you can explain and tie back to uh, measurable uh, work that's been done to, to evaluate the economies um, and the ecosystems that we're talking about? Uh, can it scale? Can it make a difference? Um, and really importantly, Will it persist over time? Have the foundations um, been laid so that it will uh, survive and persist over time? Has the capacity been built, which is a, a huge interest, I know, of this, all the attendees at this conference to make that work? So those things are all common threads. But I, I draw that distinction between that, among that, those spectrums of capital, because as you hear about them, bearing in mind, um, what is the investor looking for? It might be those same attributes that I just mentioned and more, of course, but really um, they, they can be looking at different things. So when the word bankable is used, uh, just bear in mind that it can mean different things to different people, but the soul of the enterprise and the bottom line is very similar. Right. Thanks, Ted. That's uh, super helpful. Um, okay, so now we're going to move on to our next speaker, Daniela Fernandez, who is the founder and CEO of Sustainable Ocean Alliance. Um, so this actually started as an idea from Daniela's college room at Georgetown University, and now, six years later, is a global organization cultivating and accelerating innovative solutions to protect and sustain the health of the ocean. So, Daniela, would you mind telling us a little bit about the Sustainable Ocean Alliance and how it goes about identifying and accelerating bankable ocean projects? Absolutely. Thanks, Laura, for that kind introduction. And, and it's crazy to think back to the year 2014 when SOA you know, first came to life. And, and perhaps I'd love to start there because back in 2014 when we were talking about the ocean economy. We were really thinking about the maritime sector and that we had shipping, we had um, exploitation of the ocean, we had fisheries, but we didn't necessarily we have an understanding of how can we re-engineer other industries that will, instead of harming the ocean, instead of extracting from the ocean, rather regenerate the ocean, heal the ocean. And so for me, that was um, the big aha moment I had as a college student in that in having these conversations, even at the UN level, we weren't thinking about the ocean as a source of of, you know, we weren't protecting and we weren't healing and we weren't sustaining and we were just taking from it. Um, and so uh, what I embarked on, you know, to build is, how, is to figure out like, how can we one, activate young people globally to become more active um, in this space, become more aware, become more educated. And number two, how can we find those entrepreneurs out there that can um, solve for these big threats that are facing the ocean? Um, and so that's the that's the, the little bit of the background and the story of like how SOA first began. And so SOA um, was the uh, first ever ocean accelerator um, in the space. And so we launched a program that would support uh, entrepreneurs that had an idea that were you know for-profit companies that had scalable models and that were positive ocean impact. So this meant that the first thing that we looked in a company is that not only are they going to scale and make money, but how are they going to positively impact the ocean? How is it going to be a sustainable company down the road? And so um, the way that we approach our companies is that we seek out ideas from all over the world. We currently have um, youth leaders and entrepreneurs in 165 countries. So we have a very global approach. Um, and we're also looking for companies in every sector. And um, there's room for disruption within wave energy, within shipping, within fisheries, uh, you know, within mapping the ocean floor. And so what we're trying to figure out is how can we encourage an entire generation to redefine the way that we look at these industries and make them into sustainable business models, which 
can be bankable, they can be financed and scaled. But the reality is like, how can we put sustainability at the forefront of these business models, as opposed um, to it being, you know, an afterthought or simply a marketing play by a corporation. And so that's the, the big difference that I wanted to point out that we were having these conversations about, um, you know, the possibility and the potential of these startups and these companies. Fantastic. Thanks, Daniela. That's great to hear about the process that you go through. Um, now, we are going to hear about another successful accelerator, uh, Catapult Ocean. Dear ladies and gentlemen, thanks for being here. I'm Jonas dialing in from Norway. I'm the CEO of Catapult Ocean and the CIO and partner of Catapult. I have 15 years of experience from the banking and the investment industry. Before I joined Catapult, I founded one of the leading sustainable hedge funds in the Nordics. So thanks ADB for inviting Catapult Ocean and myself to speak about acceleration and bankable ocean projects. Acceleration, venture investments in the ocean is exactly what we do at KO. For those of you that don't know us, Catapult is an impact investment firm that accelerate and invest in impact ventures globally. In addition to partners, we're owned by Catapult Foundations and manage funds on behalf of investors. Catapult Ocean is our ocean-focused fund that will launch 2019. Since then, we've made more than 42 investments globally and we're considered, yeah, as the most active ocean impact venture fund in the world. Our fund investors are family offices, pension funds, foundations, corporate ventures, and ultra high net worth investors. We always invest for market returns, but we always need to see positive impact on either our ocean or society. At the right hand side of this slide, you can see how we slice and dice the ocean into our investment domains. You got food and harvesting, we're known to have a large appetite for seaweed, algae, and alternative proteins. The energy space, growing and of importance and much needed. Solar, wind, wave, tidal. Maritime industry, that's a sector that has a large potential for impact and innovation. Lastly, we do have ocean health and frontier tech. Ocean health because we need a healthy ocean. And the frontier tech allows us to invest in do, into those deeper tech plays and potential moonshot, moonshot strategies. Acceleration is a key to Catapult and our mission. All of our portfolio companies go through our three month digital accelerator program, where we engage our global ocean network of more than 300 mentors and partners. And yes, uh, we bank on all the companies we accelerate so they receive an investment as, as well. With WWF as our founding partner, we're proud to be the only no animal harm fund in the world. And we're equally proud of our portfolio of funders that's ra that raised more than $100 million in follow-on funding last year. Speaking of, here's a few of our 42 ocean impact solutions. In the Asian region, we have Solar Duck on the upper left, offshore floating solar energy, what's not to like. They operate in Japan. Their technology is three meters above surface and really high uh, offshore constructions. The salinator upper right using their solar energy tech to desalinate seawater. Provider of, uh, of fresh water to Carlsberg in India. At the lower right, you will see a recyclo with their unique waste management platform in Myanmar. And, and in the middle there, you will also see Umami Meats in Singapore. They revolutionized the lab-grown sea, seafood industry. With that, I want, I want to thank you for your time and encourage you to be engaged, invest, and join the acceleration of these companies. Do reach out to me if you're here at the conference or you would like to hear some more about our companies or our upcoming fund. Thank you so much. Fantastic. So it's so good to see another example of how bankable projects are being both identified and supported. 
So now we will move on to our next panelist. So Nick Chiarelli is the CEO and co-founder of the Ocean Impact Organization. So similar to the example that we just saw, the Ocean Impact Organization also runs a program that identifies and accelerates bankable ocean projects. So Nick, could you tell us a little bit about why you started the organization and what your approach is to screening for quality projects? Yeah, thanks, Laura. Um, so my co-founder, Tim Silverwood, and I started working on the concept for Ocean Impact Organization about three years ago. Uh, we're both ocean lovers and we decided that we wanted to contribute a lot more to fighting um, the, you know, the range of environmental challenges that the planet's facing. And so we did a review of the Australian and global startup landscape and we quickly realised that there were very few startup ecosystems that focused on impact as much as profits. And um, I might just mention both SOA and Catapult, um, Daniela and Jonas, who blazed a little bit of a trail in this space. And, and thankfully, now there is quite a few more that are focused on impact. Um, at the time, there were quite a lot of industry-driven ecosystems focused on profit in a specific blue economy area, but it seemed that impact was really a secondary concern. So um, we realised that to make a significant contribution to ocean health, we needed to build an ecosystem that was equal parts um, inspiration and innovation and where profits can be derived with impact at the core of a business model. And um, we also realised that the only way to ensure that impact remained a central tenant of our mission was to make sure that we always remained industry and technology agnostic. You know, if you think about the complexity of the ocean and the terrestrial environment for that matter, a large part of the reason the planet is in the mess that it's in is because we as humans typically treat problems as simple one-to-one -one, um, cause and effect rather than appreciating the interconnectedness of the entire natural world. So with this in mind, it sort of defies logic to believe that we can take a siloed view with all, um, you know, working within our own industries. So being industry and technology agnostic allows us to um, ensure that ocean challenges can be tackled from all points of views and that essentially everyone has a seat at the table, at the problem solving table. So we've mirrored this approach with how we built the organization and how we screen projects. And we believe in deep collaboration and realize that um, what we know is completely at swamped by what we don't know. So when we screen applications, we involve a variety of people, including our members, mentors and advisors, that bring expertise in all range of different fields from ocean science, business and startups, technology and innovation, impact investment, impact measurement, um, design thinking, all the way through to creative industries. Uh, in the case of our major annual project, the Ocean Impact Pitch Fest, we then invite an external uh, group of independent global experts to assess those finalists. Um, and then this year we'll be running our first accelerator cohort, which will be investment backed and we'll also be bringing those investors, uh, providing them a seat at the table to ensure maximum alignment between founders and investors. Wonderful. Thanks very much for that, Nick. Um, now, I'd like to, at this point, just to encourage everybody in the audience, if you have questions for the panellists, be thinking about those and making a note of those now because there'll be an opportunity towards the end of the session um, to pose those to the panelists. So good to start thinking about that at this point. Um, so now we are gonna go back to Ted. So Ted, we would love your perspective on, you know, it sounds like there are at least a few different people and organizations out there now sort of with uh, purpose around accelerating projects, but what about the pipeline of projects itself? Do you feel like there's a lack of projects um, or is the problem around kind of matching the projects to uh, capital um, and just your perspective on how Investable Oceans is tackling both of those challenges? Uh, thank you. And um, I loved hearing our other panelists because they're, they're they're inspirational, and I, I looked up them look up to them so much. Um, they are part of a wonderful necklace of innovation 
um, system that's really spanning the globe now. And you're getting some of the sense of geographies, which also extend to all over Europe and uh, uh, down to South Africa and across uh, all across Asia. Um, and by some count, there's um, 200 um, incubators, accelerators, clusters, hubs, um, all in this in this network. And it sounds like a lot, but it's a big ocean and it's a big uh, world. And if you think about the specialization, and some are affiliated with universities, some are affiliated with uh, clusters of companies in certain areas. Um, so uh, when people say, are there too many? I say, it doesn't feel to me uh, that way at all. And what's great is um, they're collaborating and they're pulling together in ways that are very uplifting. And that's one of the wonderful things about operating in the oceans is so many people have such strong affinities and feeling, uh, feelings about it. Um, so on, on the company side, I think there's a, there's a wonderful ecosystem growing that I think will just continue to grow and accelerate. On the project side, when you talk about some of the, the big projects um, that have to be done, and the and ADB is so wonderful at, at thinking of ways to catalyze and stimulate projects. Uh, TNC as well, your own organization, is amazing at getting involved in complex transactions I like the Belize deal or the deal down in Mexico to pull all these different flavors of capitals I was talking about together. So is it is it a shortage of projects? Um, I think it's an iterative thing. As people get more comfortable putting together these, these structures and it becomes more routine and people see it operate, people at the same time are generating uh, new things because we all know there's plenty of work to be done. So I think some of it is time in motion. Um, and in the way um, to think about how is it that we can accelerate that? Um, I, I often borrow a phrase from Lonely Whale, which is where I first heard of radical collaboration. Um, and that's what it takes to really get there. And there are wonderful organizations we're a part of, as are many on this um, speakers panel, part of a thousand ocean startups, which is bringing together people to cooperate uh, and support each other. Ocean Visions is a multidisciplinary group of universities and research centers committed to working together to get discoveries and new ideas out of the laboratory into the ocean. So um, I do think that this ecosystem is growing and accelerating. These bonds are tying the technological way that we all communicate, um, the sophistication of people developing shared vocabularies. Um, I think those are all fantastic things. And I think the answer for all of us is that we have to lean in and look for ways to support the aggregate effort and partner wherever we possibly can. Wonderful. Thanks, Ted. Radical collaboration. I like it. Um, very good. So now we are going to hear from another group, Ocean 14 Capital, um, which is taking a really holistic approach to identifying projects and to funding them. Hello. Thank you very much for inviting me to attend this forum uh, on the very important subject of the blue economy. My name is Chris Goral Barnes. I'm one of the founding partners of Ocean 14 Capital. We are an impact fund within the blue economy. 14 is for SDG 14, protecting life on water. We are a very unique vehicle that brings together the expertise of finance, industry knowledge, and scientific expertise to really understand and be able to invest within the blue economy. We are 150 million growth equity fund. We've completed our first close in December of 80 million euros um, with some very high profile investors, including the European Investment Fund, who have anchored our fund. We will, uh, at final close in mid of this year, at 150 million, be the largest and therefore the most impactful fund within the blue economy. Our investment focus is on two key areas of food security and marine ecosystems. We invest in sustainable aquaculture and the value chain there, sustainable fisheries and alternatives to fish protein. And we invest in um, marine uh, and flora and marine ecosystems, seaweed and other natural areas like kelp, and of course in uh, plastics, uh, the removing, the recycling um, and the collection of plastics. Um, we're a growth equity fund um, invest in existing business. We think the biggest opportunity to drive the necessary delta of positive change within the ocean is to help to transform the existing in industry with new innovations, new technologies, and ways that we can help and support, support these companies. Uh, we look at our deal flow in terms of the tracking, the transacting, and the transformation of businesses. 
Uh, we track our companies. We have unique access and knowledge in this area. We've been investing and working in companies in this area for over 25 years as a, as a team. So we really have a unique access and knowledge of in the industry. We understand the businesses. We understand uh, how to navigate risk. We understand price realization and we have, you know, a unique proprietary deal flow of companies that we've been looking at and monitoring for for many many years we have unparalleled expertise of executing in this area so we know how to transact we know how to understand and to model companies so that actually we are really reducing reducing the, the risk and then in terms of transformation we understand the business so we know how to transform these companies to help them be better companies help them with the operating margins help them with marketing and sales and help them of course become more sustainable we are an impact fund we will be working with companies to transform them to be more sustainable to make sure they're having more of a positive impact on the ocean and we believe that companies that do good will be worth uh, uh, more money and more valuable um, we um, are very thankful to be here thank you very much for having us um, and if anybody would like to know more information it's ocean14capital.com thank you Great to hear about these examples. It's really inspiring stuff. Um, okay, now we're gonna go back to our panel. So back to Daniela. Um, so Daniela, a little bit earlier, Ted was talking about radical collaboration between diverse stakeholders. And you know, one of the stakeholder groups that sometimes tends to get left out of these sorts of conversations is youth. Um, and so we wondered if you can tell us a little bit about your view on the role for youth in bankable ocean projects um, and your perspectives on the role of young entrepreneurs specifically um, in growing the blue economy. Absolutely. So in addition to having the accelerator program, which focuses more on the for profit um, ocean tech startups that we were just talking about, we have a leadership program, which focuses more on grassroots ideas, on nonprofit concepts, on any 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 idea that a young person could have that can that we can help bring to life. Um, and just to give you some examples, this includes planting mangroves or restoring coral reefs or raising awareness about plastic pollution in their respective area. Um, and I, I think the, the beauty of, of this generation, um, Gen Z and millennials, is the fact that we no longer have to be convinced that climate change is real. Uh, we no longer have to go down the, the rabbit hole of, of trying to fight the reality that I think that we're all facing, but rather the, the nexus that we're, now that, that we're now trying to understand is like, how can we empower this generation to act? Um, there is so much passion out there. There, is, there are so many people that are looking to find meaning in their lives, that are quitting their jobs because the day-to-day -day doesn't, doesn't amount to much if at the end of you know our life we're going to look back and see a you know planet that is no longer livable so i think that for us um what we focused on through soa is providing micro grant funding to these projects we provide um, grant dollars between $1,000 and $10,000 that go into the grassroots projects. We provide support through mentorship, through resources, through education, so that these projects can come to life in a similar way that we support the, um, the ocean startup projects that we, we just talked about. So, you know, I think just overall to answer your question, I do believe that a movement of young people has to be the answer to these problems because we need an entire power generation to shift their priorities and their mindset and, and truly start believing and, and seeing themselves as active players in this space. We don't have time for people to be spectators to the climate crisis. We now have to just ask every single person, what is your skill set? How can you contribute? Um, what exactly is your goal or your role going to be um, to help sustain our planet and our ocean? Um, so I definitely believe that this next generation um, has to step up and, and come up with these ideas and come up with solutions that will enable all of us to you know, further our impact. Fantastic. Thanks, Daniela. Um, Okay, now let's go back to Nick. Um, now, Nick, I know you said earlier that Ocean Impact Organization is industry agnostic, um, but we would love your thoughts on, do you feel like there are particular sectors of the blue economy that are showing the most promise for bankable 
projects. Um, and can you give us some examples of bankable projects um, that you feel are replicable across Asia Pacific? Sure, yeah. So look, I might just start by saying that, you know, we're talking specifically about startups here. Um, so we're looking at early stage ventures, profitable ventures that um, are striving to improve ocean health alongside a profitable business model. So generally speaking, the same rules apply for ocean impact startups as would any other industry. And the most bankable projects or investable startups in this case have firstly a very clear understanding of the problem that they're trying to solve. So is the problem significant? Can it be quantified, um, et cetera? Secondly, they have a very clear understanding of who their target customers are and the value that their solution brings to those customers. It's all good and well to be targeting impact, but if you don't have a clear view to who's going to buy your product or solution, you won't be around long enough to actually be able to achieve any impact and improvement to ocean health. In the ocean space, um, there's a third factor that um, is, is really important. And it's, it's um, essentially because of the, what we call the tragedy of the commons or the fact that a lot of maritime space is public, this third factor that can significantly influence the success of a startup is government regulation. And we've seen this in the case of um, single use plastic items all over the world in the last couple of years, we've seen um, massively enhanced fishing regulations in the EU. Government regulation can quickly create a market where previously there was none. And the key to that government regulation is public pressure, which is why it's a huge part of the, um, or a, a, huge, a huge role for all the participants on today's call is also to keep lobbying individuals to put pressure on governments so that they understand the needs and wants of citizens and create regulation and legislation to, you know, to create those markets. Um, it's, it's absolutely vital. In terms of sectors, this is a, this is a tricky question because, um, you know, we, we've, we've touched on this previously, some of the other speakers, I think Ted's talked about the different definitions of bankable. Now, you know, if you were to look up the most bankable sectors at the moment, I, my my problem is that a lot of those don't factor in impact as a primary concern. I mean, you're seeing these rankings based on, on profits uh, only in some cases. So it's really only showing a part of the story and in, sometimes it can be quite misleading. So fisheries and aquaculture, um, shipping and ports, coastal and marine tourism, these sectors are probably leading the way in terms of profits. Um, we're also seeing some good progress in the maritime um, renewable energy sector with offshore solar, uh, wind, tidal and wave. But again, I'd like to caution that these sectors and the bankability of them does not necessarily include a, a measure for positive impact on the ocean. Um, for the most part, these sectors are still primarily driven by human consumption uh, for our, our needs around food and goods and services. One particular sector that, that does excite me is seaweed and, um, you know, the science behind its nutritional value and, and health benefits and, and its ability to sequester carbon. This science is really clearly understood now. The problem is how do we scale and how do we scale it quickly? So one particular example I can point to is an Australian startup called Sea Forest. Um, sea Forest won our 2021 Ocean Impact Pitch Fest and they're beginning to commercially farm a species of seaweed called asparagopsis. So it's been discovered that uh, I think by replacing uh, around 2% of, of cow feed with asparagopsis supplement, this can result in reduced methane emissions in cows by up to 80%. So a really well understood problem, coupled with a very clear understanding of their target customers being the livestock industry, and in addition, recently at COP26, we saw that a large number of uh, countries uh, signed up to a livestock methane emission reduction pledge. Um, so that's sort of the start of, um, you would think, increased regulation in this space. Um, ironically, and unfortunately, Australia was not one of these countries. Thanks, Nick. Wonderful. Um, okay. 
Next, we are going to hear from another organisation um, that is working specifically on the issue of replicability. Um, uh, and that's the IUCN, so the World Conservation Union, Blue Natural Capital Financing Facility. It's a great pleasure to be here today and talk about some of the work that we're doing with the Blue Natural Capital Financing Facility. As we all know, the saying goes, there's a lot of money and capital out there, but not enough projects that can actually be invested in. And this is exactly the point where we try and come in and help project developers on the ground to improve their nature-based solution business case. So we provide grants and technical assistance to a set of uh, assessed projects and project developers that we believe have this component on one side on the impacts for conservation and people, but also the return on investment. So here I'll show you um, very quickly a few examples of projects that we help support. And as you can see on the next slide is that we have various blueprints that we brought together to capture some of the lessons learned because it's still a very nascent market, a very nascent effort that still needs a lot of uh, information sharing and, and lessons learned. So we tried to capture some of those lessons in so-called blueprints that we have available on our website, bluenaturalcapital.org. And here you see, for example, the idea how we can move from a business as usual sort of funding structure reliant on grants and public money only to a much more innovative way of how an investment structure can look like for MPA management, in this case here in the Philippines. And the engagement of the impact investor, as well as the continuation of some private and public donors in a blended fashion, but having the opportunity to reinvest some of the, the profits made also into the actual management and running of the MPA. A next example um, shows as well the approach behind Blue Natural Capital. It's not just about one revenue stream or one ecosystem service. We know the coastal and marine ecosystems have a suite of services and benefits to us humans. And the idea behind Blue Natural Capital is really to, to maximize some of those potential revenue streams alongside the high positive impacts on conservation. So this could be, for example, seaweed farming or mangrove restoration using carbon credits, but also other sustainable um, natural resource management practices around fisheries or also fishnet recycling. So bringing that all together really offers an opportunity, an attractive business model that can generate revenues while actually um, having the impact on the ground for biodiversity and people. In the next slide, I'm just uh, providing you a quick overview because, of course, within this world of impact investing, it's important to measure and look at the successes. And some of these projects are still in their early days, but it's exciting to see how they have advanced also already with some of the support that we from the BNCFF were able to give them, increasing the areas, uh, hectares of marine protected areas, the numbers of people trained, really looking at some of more the legal and financial setup of these projects and how that can help them also as part of the bigger supply chains uh, from, from other companies that are buying their products. How can we really help these businesses move forward and still have the, the positive impact impact local community engagement that we all want to see so so desperately and yeah as last last point i wanted to show you that we've been trying to capture some of those stories and lessons learned in a different format so we we created a new podcast series where we give the project developers that you see here but also those the, the impact investor other movers and shakers in the world of uh, innovative finance for ocean an opportunity sort of to to share the various different um, community sides we have the ocean community conservation community the finance community how can we all come together learn each other's languages and really move forward and scale and mainstream some of these efforts um, in due course so please have a listen in thank you very much Okay, so now that as an audience, I feel like you've already learned a lot about the various types of bankable ocean projects. And so we are going to go to another audience poll. 
Um, so on your screen, if you could have a look at the little poll, uh, multiple choice options that should be there. Um, so, and tell us from your perspective, which sector currently has the most bankable ocean projects or the most promising bankable ocean projects? Um, so you'll see the options there are sustainable tourism, marine renewable energy, green ports and shipping, fisheries, aquaculture, or other. And if it's other, we'd love to find a way of uh, getting your ideas on that, because I think this is a great um, brainstorming opportunity with all of these people in the session today. So we'll just give you a few more seconds just to have a think about which sector really resonates with you as um, yeah, having the most or the most promising uh, bankable ocean projects based on everything we've heard so far. And perhaps if people do have thoughts for the other, one option might be if you have suggestions, you could even uh, put those in the Q&A function and we can try and come back to those ideas um, in the Q&A session, which we'll, we'll move to um, shortly. I must say, hearing all of these examples from um, the different organisations that we've had on the panel today and also from the videos that we've seen, I don't know, it's a nice antidote to, you know, some of the, um, the narrative around, you know, the oceans and the state of the environment more broadly. It can feel kind of grim. And what I love about this work is that I feel like it's really focused on positive solutions and it's very kind of oriented around hope and uh, making change in a positive way. So I hope others in the audience are also um, enjoying that feeling of optimism that comes with these sorts of um, examples. Okay, hopefully everybody's had a chance to watch their results in the poll. Okay, they should be up on the screen now. Um, okay, oh, it's moving as we look, very dynamic. Um, so we can see here, um, it's pretty much neck and neck for marine renewable energy, um, which is just slightly ahead of aquaculture. Um, so yeah, people feel like those are the ones that really spring to mind for um, bankable projects. Um, but I like that we've also got good representation from uh, the others. So sustainable tourism, 13%, green ports and shipping, 16%, and fisheries, 10%. Um, and we do have an other. So if um, if you want to put the your thoughts on the other in the Q&A function, we'll try and... Um, a bit later. Okay, now is the moment we've all been waiting for. We are going to take a few questions from the audience. Um, so I think people have already started plugging some of their questions into the Q&A function. Um, I encourage anybody else um, to take the opportunity. You don't get panelists of this quality in a room together even a virtual one um, every day. So yeah, avail yourselves of the opportunity to ask a question. Um, okay, so let's have a look at the questions that have come through. What do we have? So one of the questions here is about um, the threshold for new investors. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you are interested, for example, in being an investor, um, but, you know, I can imagine often there's sort of a minimum threshold that's needed in order to kind of be viable in investing in some of these projects. Um, 
is there a way around that? Like, are there ways of getting investors who are interested or able to kind of contribute at a smaller scale um, so that they can participate and support some of these great opportunities, um, but yeah, maybe not necessarily at the level of um, some of the very significant investments that we've heard about today? Would anyone on the panel like to respond to that question? I, I can jump in um, and just provide SOA as an example. So at SOA, in addition to having our accelerator program, we also have a venture fund. Um, and so we are able to take smaller check sizes from investors that are honestly just trying to understand what the blue economy sector looks like um, and have a, a better sense of how to track their investments, how to um, explore explore the, all of the, the range of possibilities in, in the ocean space. So um, we definitely have that option and, and we have seen a lot of other funds that are popping up um, that are you know, either SPVs for you know, potential investments or our funds that are more geared towards um, exploratory you know, arrangements as opposed to you know, like the, the 50 to $100 million out fundraisers um, that, that were mentioned. So they're definitely out there. Um, you know, happy to provide more information about that if, 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 if of interest. Wonderful. Thanks, Daniela. Um, great. Okay. So we have another question here that's come through from the audience. Um, so the audience member is interested to know in identifying what makes a project or a company bankable. Um, so aside from the positive impact to the ocean, are there other criteria that we should be considering? Um, and I might take the opportunity to piggyback on that question with a question that I had, um, which was around the issue of equity. Um, and so, you know, what can we be doing in order to make sure that, you know, underrepresented groups stand to benefit from some of the projects um, and also the, you know, accelerator function that we've heard about today, you know, what's being done across the board to kind of make sure that that um, criterion of equity um, is also showing up in the decision making um, that you all are advancing. Would anyone on the panel like to take that question? I see Ted talking. Sorry, um, I had thrown in a few criteria just uh, generally um, in response to that question in the chat, but the, the, the ones towards the end are the ones that I think open up the dialogue on this question, which is a, a critical one. And it really comes down to uh, the community orientation, the capacity building as, an, as a notion is, um, is there, are there jobs and are there, is there community support and engagement that will help this um, entity, what, whether what, whatever it is, to persist over time and not be something where people put money in and then they go away and they're disappointed five or 10 years later that it doesn't happen. So those last couple of things I mentioned um, are, I think are important, but also I think really important is um, in terms of the generation, back to your point, Laura, about are there sufficient projects they, what we should be doing is finding from the people who are operating there, who are from the community, who are living it, and know the science and know the community, um, what are the real needs? Uh, who, what is the real need of the community and what kind of engagement could there be to create, again, create jobs and communities? There's a wonderful um, a piece that just came out uh, there's a, a collaboration amongst uh, Global Stockholm Global Resilience and and Duke and some others, and they basically are looking at the at the at the small fisher um, population across the entire globe. But they're not just measuring how many fish were caught there. They're saying what effect does that have on the families, and what effect does that have on the community, and what are all the ripples that come out of that? So the people who are operating on the ground and it's it's NGOs and it's community groups and it's the individuals there. I think to generate projects from there and then go for the funding rather than start from the perspective of here's funding, what can we, where can we find to put it? I, I think we'd be well served to really um, try to be solving uh, issues that are of the day, of the moment and generate these kind of beneficial social results and equity results that uh, you and uh, the people who are asking the questions are, are looking, looking for. Wonderful, thanks, Ted. Um, 
Okay, we might go to another question now, which is specifically about the role of government in developing bankable projects. Um, and so for me, this recalls a comment that Nick made about you know, the role that regulations can play in sort of stimulating um, markets or, you know, creating the presence of markets where they may not have existed before. Um, and so I wondered, Nick or anyone else, um, if you would be willing to talk a bit about the role of government um, in developing these sorts of projects. Yeah, sure. Um, it really is an extension of the comment I made earlier. Like you say, it's, um, I'm really pessimistic about the ability of governments to drive change. I don't think there's a government anywhere in the world that is what I would call proactive to responding to um, significant issues. The only time that a government will move is if there's enough public pressure and enough individuals get together and enough voices come together uh, to essentially tell them that they'll be voted out at the next at the next election if they don't act um, so it really it comes down to the individual level and again i'd reiterate that there's a space for everyone on this call whether or not you're an investor or a founder every small action you can take to support founders and investors in this space every petition that you sign um, builds community and shows government what we think are in, are important in terms of looking after our ocean and, and the environment Right. Many thanks, Nick. Um, okay, very good. We've got a few more minutes, so I think we can um, fit in a couple more questions. Um, there's one here that I like, uh, which is um, intended, I think, to temper some of the optimism that I was talking about before um, with uh, sort of referencing this quote, is it Einstein, I'm not sure where it comes from, but about, you know, expecting that we can solve problems using the same thinking and the same mindset um, that caused us the problems to begin with. Um, and so this audience member um, sees, frankly, um, you know, risks around blue washing with some of what um, <coughs> has been talked about today. Um, and so is keen to know what um, can we be doing in this space um, to try and avoid blue washing and, you know, really to audit what the environmental benefits are of this work and sort of make sure that there's a really strong defensible uh, benefit from an environmental perspective of these various projects that we're describing. Does anyone have thoughts on that? I, I can definitely jump in. And when when we think about impact, I, I think it, it's really important to understand um, where that impact is coming from. Um, and you know, I, that's why I, I definitely love um, Nick's perspective in the sense of like impact has to come first, and impact has to be uh, the responsibility. And you know, one of the challenges that we're seeing across the board around these ocean solutions is that it's so hard to measure a company's impact because one, it hasn't been done before, and two, the companies are just trying to figure out, you know, how do you measure how many, you know, how much carbon dioxide you prevented from entering the atmosphere or how many pieces of mangroves have been planted and what does that mean for the ocean so yeah i think it's understanding impact and understanding the framework for impact is number one something that has to be solved for um, and something that has to be agreed upon um, every single you know ocean agency out there so that we can have collective understanding of how we're measuring you know the success of a company that's number one um, on the corporate side i think that we also need to make great strides to not have corporations just you know put out marketing dollars and say you know we are now ocean friendly because we supported this event or, or this nonprofit. Um, i think we need to start looking as to what their practices are and what is their supply chain look like how are they utilizing you know their own carbon footprint and serving their population um, and so i think as consumers, we have to start asking those questions and demanding answers and demanding transparency because we can no longer hold you know, people accountable based on what they're saying if their actions are you know, otherwise. So I would say that's for corporations and for governments. Um, how do we prevent you know, what I like to say uh, you know, the year 2050 proclamations? Um, the reality is that a lot of the current you know, climate action goals are happening very, they're ambitious, but there's no short-term plan that we're seeing. And a lot of these politicians that are out there making these commitments, they're not going to be in power by the time 
2050 comes around. And so, you know, what we as, you know, youth ocean leaders, we ask for is short term milestones that we can hold these politicians accountable that they can meet today in the next couple of years, as opposed to simply putting out lofty goals that we won't be able to hold them accountable to. Um, so those are those would be the, the three different, I would say, areas around, you know, blue washing them can prevent and how we all can play a role um, to um, hold people more accountable. Wonderful. Thanks, Daniela. Um, okay, we are getting very close to the end of this session. So I would like to turn it back to the panelists. If you can share with us a 30 second closing remark that you would like to leave with the audience before we sign off today. Uh, we'll start with you, Ted. Uh, thanks. And thanks so much for the session. This was terrific. And by the way, great questions. Happy to follow up with anyone who would like to. Um, I think it's uh, it's really a moment for us. It's an it's an inflection point. I think um, the increasing awareness that climate and ocean are really interrelated, starting with the IPCC um, Krauser report a few years ago and before that, but really building up and it's becoming part of the, the shared experience to say every other breath from the ocean or uh, absorbing 90% um, of the heat or the transportation. And those are all consciousness building. So I think we're at an amazing point in time where we can really make a difference um, for the oceans and for oceans, climate, the whole ecosystem and the entire planet. So uh, it's just a, a way of saying, I, I hear the part about the, the optimism. Yes, let's watch out for blue washing, but you know what? Um, let's all lock arms and, and charge ahead. It's important times. Love it. Thanks, Ted. Uh, Nick, quick final closing comment. Sure, I might just reiterate something I've said a couple of times already and say, get involved. There's um, there's a role for everyone. Um, we, we really, to see this space kick up a notch, we need to attract more dollars. And the way to do that is that we need to attract mainstream investors. The way to mainstream investors is to build um, awareness about what, what some of the founders are already doing in this space, it's fantastic in order to attract more money, in order to attract more founders. We, we really still are, um, have lots of room to focus on ecosystem growth um, as a road to um, ultimate impact. Um, and, and the second thing I'd say is that if anyone is interested in um, uh, at investing in this space, um, they can reach out to me on LinkedIn. We'll be uh, opening a, a startup seed fund investing in, in Asia Pack um, within the next uh, month. So uh, I'm on LinkedIn, happy to connect. Wonderful, thanks, Nick. And Daniela, the final word from you. Absolutely. So the first thing I would say is for people to commit. <laughs> we just need commitment across the board to help our ocean and you know, to be a part of this movement that we're building. And um, number two, I would say find a way in to re-engineer or disrupt an industry. There is so much opportunity right now to create a new solution, to find a new project, to build, to innovate. Um, so don't take that for granted. We're living in this you know, wonderful day and age where you can build something that didn't exist and make the world a better place. Um, and the last thing I would say is um, if, if you want to get involved and just be a part of this you know, ocean ally movement that we're building, definitely um, you know, reach out to Sustainable Ocean Alliance. Um, check out what we're doing at SOA and we're just happy to support projects and ideas and help them bring them to life. Excellent. Thank you so much to Daniela, Nick and Ted for a fabulous session. And thank you also to our audience for joining us. Um, appreciate you being here with us and encourage you to sit in on the remaining sessions in the forum. Thank you again.